Welcome to Science with Tal. In today's video, I want to cover a particular group of neurons in the brain that release a transmitter called orexin, or in some other nomenclatures, hypocretin. On your screen, you can see a roadmap of what we will cover, and the focus of this video will be to provide a brief overview on the influence of orexin neurons on sleep and give a few clinical applications based on the knowledge that we will accumulate. Before we dive deeper into this video, I want to mention very quickly that I will assume some neuroscience background out of you. So, if I go too quickly over some concepts and it isn't clear, make sure to let me know in the comments so I can redirect you to the appropriate resources. Now, to understand the core concepts that relate to orexin neurons and sleep, we first need to understand some basic concepts of how human sleep-wake patterns occur and how they are mediated by the brain. Starting with our sleep-wake patterns, some of the key markers that scientists use to differentiate whether someone is awake or not include brain activity, levels of eye movement, and muscle tone. These behaviors are respectively measured by the electroencephalogram, or EEG, the electrooculogram, or EOG, and finally the electromyogram, or EMG. By using these behavioral markers, it's possible to separate the awake state from the sleep and divide the sleep state into four distinct phases. Three of these four phases correspond to non-rapid eye movement, or non-REM sleep, and the remaining phase corresponds to rapid eye movement, or REM sleep. If we first consider the EOG, you will notice that at wake and during REM sleep, there are a lot of eye movements, whereas eye movements tend to be lowest while progressing through the NREM stages. In terms of the muscle tone, the tone is highest at wake and then progressively diminishes during non-REM sleep. During REM sleep, the muscle tone reaches its lowest point in phases called the tonia, where you are essentially paralyzed. Lastly, for brain activity, EEG recordings can be a bit more complex to understand, but for the purpose of this video, the idea is that when one progresses from the wake to the non-REM3 stage, the activity of the brain becomes slower and more synchronized, but during REM sleep, brain activity is faster and somewhat similar to what is seen during the awake stages. As a quick last detail to mention with respect to brain activity, REM sleep is typically associated with dreams, and that will be relevant later when we will discuss narcolepsy. Altogether, the use of the EEG, EOG, and EMG to characterize sleep phases is known as a polysomnogram, and while recording these measures across the night for an individual at sleep, we can come up with a plot called the hypnogram that traces how the different sleep stages evolve across the night. This final figure represents the typical sleep architecture in humans, and we will later see what can happen to it when orexin transmission is impaired. Now, when we consider how the brain orchestrates these different phases of wakefulness, non-REM sleep, and REM sleep, there are a ton of different areas and neurotransmitters that have been found to form very complex circuits to govern this. The mapping of the wake and sleep circuit has been an active area of research for many decades, and a lot of aspects on mammalian sleep remain unresolved. Here, to understand the purpose of orexin neurons that are located in the lateral hypothalamus, I want to provide a quick overview of how sleep is believed to be mediated in the brain. Broadly speaking, regions involved in wake sleep circuits can either be part of the wake promoting system or the sleep promoting system. If we consider the wake promoting system first, the areas that are a part of it typically have their highest levels of activity when the organism is at wake and the output of this system projects everywhere in the brain. Within this wake promoting system, there are generally two types of areas those that are a part of the ascending arousal system in green and those that are a part of the modulatory system in blue. To put it simply, the regions a part of the ascending arousal system are very important to keep the entire organism awake and any lesions in the system, especially in the pedoculopontine or parabrachial nucleus, can result in a coma or essentially the loss of consciousness. On the other hand, the modulatory system is much more complex as it contributes to wakefulness in more indirect ways and lesions in these areas typically have more subtle effects on sleep-wake patterns. When it comes to the sleep-promoting system, there are a few areas like the ventral lateral preoptic nuclei and the median preoptic nuclei that have their highest levels of activity during sleep, and they have local projections that act to shut down the wake-promoting system by releasing inhibitory neurotransmitters. Now, in this very complex but yet simplified system, let's take a closer look at what orexin neurons in the lateral hypothalamus do. To understand the role of these neurons, we first need to get an idea of what orexin is and how it signals. It turns out that orexin is a neuropeptide, which means that it is a protein made from the genome. There are two different isoforms of this protein, orexin A and orexin B, and they differ based on the exon that is kept after alternative splicing. 
The activation of orexin neurons causes the release of either orexin A or B, and they can subsequently bind to their respective receptors. There exist two receptors for orexin, and they are both G-protein coupled receptors with different affinities for either orexin A or B. In terms of their associated G-protein, they can mediate a diversity of pathways, but OX1R is typically associated with the GQ pathway and the OX2R with the GQ and GI pathway. I will not go into the details of the downstream effects, but if you want more information about this, you can consult this review for which there will be a formal source in the conclusion. To keep it simple, the activation of either OX1R or OX2R causes an excitation via an increase in intracellular calcium through the opening of calcium channels and the increase in kinase activity. With this in mind, we can turn our attention to the function of orexin neurons, and it turns out that they have two primary roles with respect to sleep. Namely, they contribute to the promotion of wakefulness and the suppression of REM sleep. To promote wakefulness, orexin neurons send excitatory projections to modulate key wake-promoting areas. Additionally, orexin neurons get inhibited by the VLPO, which entails to some extent that they are likely to promote wakefulness. In terms of their role in REM sleep, it's first important to establish that one important area that generates REM sleep is a region called the subcerealis, and this region receives inhibitory projections from the ventral lateral periacodotal gray and the locus cerealis to suppress the REM sleep it generates. Orexin neurons contribute to suppressing REM sleep as they provide excitatory projections to the ventral lateral PAG and locus cerealis, and thus indirectly turn off REM sleep. Based on these functions of orexin neurons, we can now consider two interesting clinical applications that relate to orexin transmission. The first is a sleep disorder called narcolepsy, and it is believed that this disorder is caused by an impaired orexin transmission, for example, by an autoimmune attack that destroys orexin neurons. The classical symptoms of narcolepsy include excessive daytime sleepiness and the intrusion of REM sleep events inside of wakefulness, such as cataplexy, sleep paralysis, and hypnagogic hallucinations. You will recall from our section on the polysomnogram that REM sleep is characterized by muscle paralysis periods of atonia and brain activity likely to be associated with dreams. As such, given that the primary roles of orexin are to turn REM sleep off and promote wakefulness, having impaired orexin transmission leads to increased sleepiness and increased REM events throughout the day like cataplexy, where muscle tone will be lost upon excitation, or dream-like experiences called hypnagogic hallucinations that happen during wake. The increase in REM sleep can also be noticed in hypnograms of narcolepsy patients, where they will initiate REM sleep much sooner. As a quick note, the narcolepsy hypnogram that is shown here is inspired by this report that shows a true narcolepsy hypnogram. You can read more about this report from the references. The last quick clinical application that I want to consider relates to insomnia, which is a sleep disorder characterized by troubles with falling asleep, staying asleep, or having good quality sleep. When we consider pharmacological treatments for insomnia, one class of drugs that has recently gained traction takes advantage of the orexin transmission system. Two of these drugs that have been FDA approved in the past few years include suvorexant and lamborexant. These two drugs both act as orexin receptor antagonists, and what this simply means is that these drugs take the spot of orexin A and orexin B on the receptors and prevent orexin from mediating its function. Since orexin promotes wakefulness, these two drugs block that effect and promote sleep. This final detail concludes our brief overview on orexin transmission in the brain and its effects on sleep. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in our next discussion.